Good morning slash afternoon. Uh, this is Todd Healy with C3 and would like to welcome you to the 22222 webinar event for our group and an event that only occurs once every 100 years, not the CNC, the dating. In fact, this is our 20th presentation with CNC, so we're really pleased to have you all here from all over Texas, Dallas, San Antonio, New Braunfels, the Valley, also in Mexico City, welcome Jose down there, glad to have you on the call. And we're really pleased today to present our topic, which is back to the future, the central role of family legacy, family governance in today's estate planning. For any of us that have a family or work with families that are interested in preserving their legacy, their wealth, we are pleased to have Tom speak with us today. Uh, we will ask, I'm gonna introduce Tom just in just one second, but we'd ask that uh, you hold your questions, put them in the Q&A please, and we'll have a couple of breaks where Tom will, will take those questions and also leave some time at the end. Uh, and this is being recorded, so we, we will send it to those of us, those on the call we will receive a recorded copy of it. So we've heard for years and years and years, the theme that shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves in three generations. That's something you're gonna hear from Tom as well this morning. The thing that's different about Tom is he's lived it. And for those of us that are on the call because we've heard Tom before and we always learn something from him, we value his perspective and the reason he's doing what he's doing today. Uh, Tom has a very interesting background. He's been with banks. He's uh, currently president of Genleg, Genleg Company. It's a firm that provides guidance and education to families and their advisors. He helps them with transitioning significant capital, both financial, which is tangible, obviously, and human capital, which is intangible. And the focus of his business is transferring from one generation to the next. He's truly a recognized leader in the family governance and legacy planning arena. He's worked with over 260 families, facilitating family meetings where they focus on transparent communication, entrepreneurial motivation, philanthropic vision, legacy planning, which he has a very interesting definition for that you'll hear about in just a minute, succession development, and then endowing the process for the future so that it all can create a generational family bond. He's got a bachelor's degree in economics from Ithaca College and has spoken to way too many organizations to name, but I do wanna highlight a couple of them. First of all, the world's president organization, which is an outgrowth of the young president's organization, spoken to Harvard Business School, Yale University, Tiger 21, the Museum of Art, and Heckerling, many of us recognize that, to name just a few. So Tom, without further ado, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you for being here. Well, thank you for having me and uh, welcome everybody. And thank you uh, for attending. Uh, we do have quite a bit uh, I'm hoping to cover. So I'm gonna jump right in. I'm gonna screen share as well. And hopefully you can already uh, see the screen. Um, of what I'm going to be covering, but I'm glad that Todd in the introduction talked about the fact that uh, all families can benefit from what I'm going to be talking about. It is not just the high net worth families. Now, granted, I know that my wife and I focus when we work with coaching high net worth families um, primarily, but anybody can benefit from what we do. In fact, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, that in my own family, my father's family came from a pretty wealthy American family. My mother came from a very low net worth Cuban family. I might have learned more about wealth preservation, true wealth of a family from my mother's family who had no money. But wealth isn't money. It, part of it is, but there's a lot of other things that human capital. My father's family had financial capital, but didn't have the human capital. And, uh, and so it really is interesting how families that have financial capital and human capital are actually making the longer term difference. And that's what we're going to be focusing on. Um, just some statistics to focus on of why this is relevant and timely nowadays. In a MindSpring study not long ago of the respondents, 61% rated legacy development as a top financial need. And yet they said their advisors, their estate planning advisors, were not focusing on that in putting together their estate plan. 86% of families, according to a Morningstar uh, survey, uh, said that leaving values and, and life lessons as it was an important part of inheritance. And again, that was not something that they were saying was prioritized at all in their estate plan or with their advisors. David York is a top estate planning attorney out in Utah, and um, he had a, he's done 
he's one of the few advisors I know in the country. And I know a lot of estate planners. There are very few estate planners in the entire country that I've ever met that understand how to incorporate the family purpose into the estate planning process itself. There are a lot of people that can help you with the taxes and the tax minimization and control of assets after the parents are gone. But very few are really making this transition into what I'd call legacy planning and have it embedded in the document, not in a side letter, embedded in the document. But David York's a good example of it, and he, he's done some wonderful work. Marvin Blum in, in uh, Dallas area, Fort Worth area, is another great example of this. But um, David York found that of the families coming into his office, very high net worth families, very, often business owner families, 90% of them, he said, uh, had plans that were not currently as they walked in dealing with their goals, wants, and objectives. Because believe it or not, their goals, wants, and objectives were usually not to get 10% more money to their kids. Their goals, wants, and objectives were mostly for whatever we leave to the kids to have them receive it well, have it be the blessing we intend. How do we prepare them for that? And that was a missing piece. I spoke at Heckerling uh, uh, last time they had a physical Heckerling um, on this topic. And it was interesting, TD North had done a study of the Heckerling attendees the year before. And it was one of the reasons they invited me to speak. But what they found in their survey when they were asked, uh, Heckerling attendees were asked, what's the biggest threat to your estate planning for your clients? They said family conflict. And they weren't, and that was the biggest response by far, biggest issue and concern. And it wasn't that we want to figure out how to draft documents that they were looking for into. How do we draft documents to protect the assets from family conflict? They were saying, our family, our clients are dealing with family conflict right now. How do we help them with that? And then how do we help them incorporate a conversation process where we can incorporate the family unified shared values into the overall plan down the road? Well, our own studies have shown, and along with uh, the studies done by Roy Williams and Vic Presher, have found that most families are failing at preserving family long-term, multi-generationally. And if you're not preserving the sense of family multi-generationally, it's very hard for a fractured, disjointed family to preserve the financial assets as well. People often focus on it's about the money. The money is disappearing. Well, it's because the family's disappearing that is causing the money in most cases to disappear along the way as well. So an 80 plus percent of families um, these are a little bit down from what Williams and Precious original research showed, but we were not able to, and most of the other studies I've seen were not able to document the enormity because they were focusing in their original studies on, well, did the family lose the business? And, um, and John Ward of Kellogg School was also focusing on that in his original study. Was the family losing the business? Well, they might have lost the business or sold it, but they might still have wealth. They might have other businesses. And so we found it was a little bit lower than what they were originally pro uh, projecting, but it's still a very high number, 60% by the end of the second generation, 80% by the end of the third. And that's where Todd mentioned that shirt sleeve to shirt sleeve phenomenon that we all are concerned about, that first generations create the wealth. Second generations get used to the wealth. Third generations enjoy the heck out of the wealth. And then the fourth generation lament the fact that it's now gone. My own family, uh, as, as Todd mentioned, is right about where that red dot is. My great grandfather uh, was president of Boston Safe Deposit and Trust Company, grew it to be the largest financial institution in the Northeast by virtually any measure. And it was dominant. He started a foundation in Boston that right now has a little bit more than a billion dollars in it. So he was doing pretty well, even by Texas standards. He was doing okay. Um, but his estate plan was designed to get the bulk of the money in this in the family down to the family i'm his great grandson and that money was gone a long time ago not because of bad investment management he owned an investment management company so if think, you think you can invest your money out of this problem you're deluding yourself not gone because of bad planning one of his sons my grandfather's brothers was one of the one of the top estate planning attorneys in the country in his day one of the founding members of actec different name back then, but same organization. And, um, and his son became the president of ActTech later on. So it wasn't gone because of bad planning. There was phenomenal estate planning in the family. It's gone because of how the family operated. And when I say that, I'm not saying anything bad about the family. Wonderful, loving, great family. But there was, they were just doing what they thought was normal from generation to generation. But nobody in the family and none of the advisors were teaching them what it could look like, what it otherwise could look like, what was normal, and what could it look like? Well, 
and m money can disappear a lot faster than I'm indicating here. As you know, Bill Huang from Arco, Arco Law, I can never pronounce it, group, he lost $20 billion in two days. Well, just to beat him, because Zuckerberg likes to beat people, um, he lost $30 billion in one day. And this is 2.22.22 on 2.22.22 at two o'clock in the afternoon, just about, he lost $30 billion. Well, happiness is having a large, loving, caring, close-knit family in another city. Uh, and that's, you know, how do we preserve the sense of family? Because if the family can hold together, what you're going to see is a family that's holding together is much more likely to be able to preserve things like the family business, like the family wealth, like the family foundation. Um, so what does that look like? The definition of fail is first and foremost, they're losing their sense of who they are as a family. It's amazing how often family members don't know their family history, multi-generationally. They don't know their great-grandparents on both sides of the family. Um, it's amazingly how rarely that's the case. Uh, second thing that they lose is they lose a sense of knowing each other within the family. Again, when families gather together for their five-year reunions when they get older, um, it's, it's amazing how often they need name badges because I forget who those cousins are, especially second cousins. And so they're losing a sense of who they are. I often hold up a cell phone when I'm doing public presentations and say, if, um, how, if somebody, one of your second cousins called you right now and you picked up the phone but didn't see the name, could you recognize them by voice? as your second cousin. And most people are like, are you kidding me? I mean, I don't even know their names. So we all say family is the most important thing. And yet families are falling apart incredibly quickly. And advisors are typically not helping anywhere near as much as they could have. The title indicated that you know before there were estate taxes, which around 1916, there was estate planning. Well, why would there be estate planning before there were estate taxes? Because nowadays, estate planning is almost entirely about the taxes. <laughs> Well, back then it was about the people, the purpose, what our intention, our values. And if you read an 1800 will, it's embedded in the document. Why isn't that still the case? And that's what I mean by certain attorneys are starting to re-embed some of these things, legacy planning back into the mix. And it's very few and far between, but there are some out there. The third thing families were losing and the least important was losing their money in their businesses. I know those are important. But they're not as important, according to the parents and that we're working with, uh, as the family know knowing each other and being able to work together and the family knowing their history long term, knowing who we are. So Leonard Sweet said that, you know, what you did is your history. What, what you set in motion in your family is your family legacy. Some statistics, though, that are pretty daunting. This, again, comes from some of Williams and Precious' work, but also in our own work, because my wife and I have now run family meetings for over 270 families. But we've, in addition to that, surveyed an additional 200 families or more than that, that have succeeded multi-generation and looking for what are the themes of what they're doing that's different that we hopefully can educate people on and, uh, and move people forward. But what we are finding, and if, again, very similar to Williams and Pressure's original work, 60% of families that are failing would attribute that failure due to lack of trust around group decision-making. Now you're gonna see that comes back time and time again in what we're gonna talk about. How do we build trust around group decision-making? The second thing that, that they were losing or the second biggest reason for losing was uh, unprepared heirs. People receive money, they didn't have the vocabulary of what to do with it. And this is important. For the 77% of the wealthy people you might be dealing with in this country are first generation wealth. That's what the studies are showing. The wealthiest people in this country that, are, that, uh, that we look at are 77% are of the time first generation. It's not all old money. It's often new money. And they come from what they would define as blue collar or working class background. The reason that's important is preparing themselves for wealth that they earned themselves over time is different than preparing their children for wealth that they might receive in a moment by a distribution or a gift or a bequest. Preparing yourself for wealth, you had to learn, they probably knew things about wealth before they had any. <laughs> they knew things like budgeting and lifestyle. What can I afford and not afford and, and savings and taxes? They knew a lot of things about wealth before they had it. 
Second generations don't have the urgency, don't have the necessity, and they don't have the wealth to deal with right away. So how do we encourage them and how do we get them involved? And it requires motivation. This you're going to see is, I think, one of the primary roles we as advisors can add to what we're offering to our highness worth families. How do we help the family educate next generations in a motivational way of why they need to know it along the way? Well, the third thing that uh, was causing failure, 10% of the failure was due to no clarity of feeling like I have a purpose in my family. I don't have a role in my family. Most families that we deal with in the estate planning area give their children the sense that a few of you have are really important to our family, and most of you are not at all. Now, nobody would use those terms. Nobody would say it that way, but they give this sense because these are the people in the family that are now going to be running the family business or running the family foundation or running the family, you name it, investment management or trustees. And then there's everybody else. We just love you, but you know, you know, you're not important. Well, how do we change that? And it turns out if a family succeeds multi-generationally, it's highly likely that the people that we think of down here were more likely the cause of the family succeeding. They had important roles. We just didn't identify it. We didn't celebrate it. We didn't talk about it. And so that's one of the biggest reasons that families are failing. We're not giving everybody a sense that you're involved, you're important. And less than 5% of the failure was due to mistakes made in the planning and investing areas. Maybe the advisor doing a great job on the money side, but 95% of the rate reason that families are failing is not about the money. It's because of the family. These are culture related issues. Business owners talk about business culture a lot. There's a lot of focus on that. Peter Drucker talked about it a lot as well. He said, he had this famous quote. He's a business consultant and he said, culture eats strategy for breakfast. And his whole point was you as a, as a CEO can focus on the numbers and the metrics and the sales and the initiatives and the business building, but the culture of your business itself is perhaps more important than anything else you do. And the same is true in families. And yet we as advisors almost always focus on the strategy around the money, the tactics around the money, as opposed to what's the culture the family look like. We, my wife and I often say this to, you know, when we meet somebody in their business owner, we'd say, you know, hey, a strong business cannot hold a family together, but a strong family can hold a business together. What are you doing about the family? I don't care about your business. I'm more concerned about your business preservation by knowing what you're doing with your family. And don't tell me you're training up one of your kids to be the CEO of the business. That's not building the family. That's building an individual. So what, what's interesting is there was a, a graphic that we created that um, that Jim Grubman, uh, you know, gave me an idea on this and everything we were looking at, all the research fit into this. But if just imagine wealth going up as you move over to the right in this graphic and level of human independence, oops, wrong side, um, over here, level of human uh, dependence or independence going here, but kind of in reverse order, dependent people like babies up at the top and then independent like teenagers and becoming young adults and all, and then interdependent people, a higher intellectual state, but in reverse order. And there was a this sort of belt, a wide tail bell shaped curve going on that low net worth families had tremendous interdependence. And what I mean by that is dinner table conversations in a low net worth family are pretty consequential. When, you know, Johnny says, can I borrow the car on Friday night? Everyone might get involved because it might be the car. When Jill says, can I go to college? Everyone might get involved because if she goes to college, everyone's life's going to change. Um, but they're making consequential decisions even at dinner. But even during the day, they're having to make decisions like who gets a bathroom first in the morning and who you know, shares bedrooms with each other and who does the chores. And, and many times children in a low net worth family to kind of paint the picture broader, they often go to public school, come home at the end of the day and um, they have to work together. And they, and they often have summer jobs and they live at home usually. They don't go to summer camp. Lots and lots and lots of opportunities to have to learn how to make decisions together. Do you remember the number one reason that families fall apart? due to lack of trust around group decision-making. Low net worth families were making decisions together all the time. They might not like it, but they actually knew more about how to work with each other by experience than a high net worth family. High net worth families had the privilege of getting away from all that. And they had the privilege of being able to raise their children in that middle dot. Because if somebody in that lower left-hand corner 
has chutzpah and ability, and they build up some financial wealth. They want to get away from all that. They want to raise their children to be independent. What does that look like? Well, dinner table conversations in a more independent family tend to be more social. How's your golf game, dad? How's your tennis game? You know, it's wonderful. Seems really nice, but it's almost more like a cocktail party. And, um, and there's, it's not as consequential. Many times these children have their own bedrooms, sometimes their own bathroom in suite. And they uh, oftentimes, not always, but they often go to private school and they often go to summer camp. More and more opportunities to be separate. The simple imagery we often give is I say, look, families do this automatically. Wealth increases the speed at which they do this. All we're trying to add is a little bit of this to whatever you're doing as a family. And you're going to see what that could look like if we wanted to add a little bit of this. And if we want to add a little bit of this into the plan itself, we can differentiate ourselves as advisors by talking about this and we can differentiate ourselves and we can build more business. You can raise the, the level of net worth of the families you're working with by talking about these things. These are very interesting to the families that we're working with, but you can also then uh, bring in more new clients. It's hard to differentiate when you're gonna talk about estate tax planning from a number standpoint, investment management, product, you name it. Very hard to differentiate yourself because people think they know what you're talking about and they've got it covered. They're wrong. But they think that, <laughs> and if they think that, it's very hard to get them to listen. Well, uh, this lower left-hand corner that I was painting before, these people are sharing assets by necessity. And this is an entrepreneurial incubator over here. 77% of entrepreneurs in this country, as I said before, would self-define that they came from this lower net worth, working class, blue collar background. And so when I paint the picture of what I just described to you, you wouldn't believe how many of them are not in there like, oh my goodness, you're describing my upbringing and you're describing how I'm trying to raise my kids. Because that middle dot where they raise their kids is an entrepreneurial kill zone. And when you sit, then start talking about what that could look like, they're going again, I can't believe it. How do I change this? Um, now, most parents want to encourage their children to move in that right-hand direction there and you know, continue to be independent and thrive and make more money. Uh, and by encouraging that, some actually do move in that direction. But unfortunately, what they're finding is by motivating children for that, there's a higher percentage that can end up growing up uh, in the middle area where they can feel a sense of guilt or embarrassment by the lifestyle. Um, gee, my friends don't have go, go to summer school or my friends are on scholarship at college and, you know, and it, it can be really, it can be difficult. And typically not when they're young, they're just growing up in the lifestyle they're growing up in. But when they go to college and they ask their, you know, friend at college, so where do you summer? And the college roommate says, at home. Um, you know, it can just, it, it gets difficult. We were with the family meeting just last week where one of the family members was saying, yeah, I really was, uh, it was a problem when I would talk about our second home or our boats and our yachts and our, and I just had, I, it was embarrassing. It was awkward. And I had to not only stop talking about it, I had to get my family to not talk about it when I were on my friends. What they're finding in the studies then is children raised in that independent phase. Um, are uh, unfortunately quite likely to either never leave the dependent phase of life or are likely to return to that again. Um, Madeline Levine in her book, The Price of Privilege, if you haven't read it, it's really worth reading. It's in my book list. But in her research, she's found that children growing up in an affluent environment or in a high net worth family are two to five times more likely to have some of these presenting problems I'm listing in the upper left hand corner there with loneliness and anxiety and depression. These are things we had as an epidemic in America before COVID. COVID made it worse. High net worth families are two to five times more likely to have those presenting problems. We can really help clients if we can help them get into this space. And you know, even if they don't have a kid that is presenting a problem, Americans in general are indicating they're at a higher level of anxiety and stress. Well, wealth doesn't cause any of these problems. It's not wealth's fault. Wealth allows it. Parents often lovingly and intentionally use wealth 
in ways that often create a higher likelihood of some of these unintended negative consequences. And nobody seems to be pointing it out or not enough people are pointing it out um, along the way. A few more statistics, anxiety, the, again, this is where COVID's really come in. Anxiety systems are three times as high, depression four times. 63% of young adults have symptoms of anxiety and depression. Loneliness off the charts. Anxiety rates are through the roof. Alcohol sales online up 400%. Um, 13% have increased substance use uh, over time. And again, loneliness and stress. Adults reporting negative impact on mental health. Again, f these all existed before COVID. It's just we're in a hyper situation where we could really help families by being able to address some of this. So our the, the whole business model that my wife and I created is trying to help families from, you know, having children moving back in this area or staying in that area to moving down, if possible, at least moving to an interdependent phase. How do we reintroduce interdependence? Because if you're going to become interdependent as a high net worth family member, you don't have to do it. If anything, you have the privilege of getting away from it. This has got to be voluntary and it's got to be, and you're only going to do that voluntarily if you've got understanding. Who's best to give the create the understanding? I actually think it's you all on the call. The advisors may be able to speak better into the family because if the parents try and take on this message and this mantle, it's like another lecture or viewed as another lecture. So how do we add this to our practice? One of the things that my wife and I do a lot is consulting with wealth advisors on. How do we add this language to what we're doing? How do we differentiate ourselves? And maybe how do we add some of these services to what we're actually offering? Because um, that's really necessary out there. Well, even if you do a brilliant job on all this and you've just got the most well-adjusted kids and they're all working incredibly well together, then they get married. And the odds are from the middle um, in my little graphic there, they're going to be marrying people coming from that lower left-hand area just by numbers. There aren't that many people at, the, at a high enough level of net worth that they have estate tax planning problems. They just aren't. The exemptions are too high. And most of Americans are – so that means that their, their candidate pool is probably – on the lower end, how do we onboard spouses into our family where they actually, and even if we did a great job with our kids, how we have these other people. What I find really interesting is wealthy families often do this faster. They marry into families that have actually, maybe from a lower net worth, have a little bit more togetherness. So where do your kids, if you're in a wealthy family, where do your kids want to hang out on Thanksgiving or Christmas or go on vacation? Believe it or not, it's amazing how often they want to go on these vacations with the lower net worth family <laughs> than the higher net worth family because of the camaraderie, the knowing each other, the, the feeling. So again, this, these culture issues are really powerful to add to what we're doing. That's what my wife and I call this a familyness culture and an entrepreneurial mindset. There's a lot to that that I'm going to skip for now. Um, we call the middle dot the red zone. We call the lower left-hand corner the orange zone. And then the lower right is the green zone. The healthy zone is actually in between the two. Um, independence is great, but not to the point of estrangement. Uh, interdependence is great, but not to the point of collectivism. Uh, so there is, uh, there is a, a benefit to both. The vision that we use on this is we imagine with families, imagine you're looking at railroad tracks going off to the distance. They go out to a vanishing point on the horizon, and they look like they come together. And they don't, but they look like they're coming together. And there are three things going on in this vision that help parents start to get a sense of, the, of how these are different things to focus on. There's the right-hand rail, which is the money and the business. And and that's really important. Don't get me wrong. It's really important. Um, and we're going to focus on that. But there's the left-hand rail. Are we intentional about the relationships? Do we really, to know and to be known, to trust and to be trusted, to love and to be loved, are we intentional about that? And then interestingly, these middle, uh, the cross ties that hold this all together, are they're not quite just focusing on the relationship. It's not focusing on the business yet or the money and the, and the real estate investments and all. It's these activities we can do as a family that would hopefully encourage us to learn how to make decisions together. Again, remember the number one reason families are falling apart due to lack of trust around group decision-making. 
these activities in the middle are the opportunity for them to practice and learn how to work together. And it's things like family philanthropy, family entrepreneurship. That's a really cool idea that I'd love to talk to you about um, offline. We don't have time to get into all this today, but um, family education process. This is not sending your kids to college. This is teaching them at home. What does it look like? I'm going to show you an example of that in a minute, because if they're going to build trust, trust requires three things, reliability, sincerity, and competence. You can't evidence reliability, sincerity, and competence if you're not doing things with other people, trying to do something. And without all three, trust is lost. It's never built or it's lost. And that's why we really encourage these activities in the middle when we get there. But again, um, we hopefully get there over time. What we normally see with a family is, yeah, there's a lot of focus in the business, there's an assumption that family just means all this. Oh yeah, we just have a great time together. So our family's really tight. Oh yeah. Um, I just don't believe it anymore. I mean, I used to believe it and I'm just finding that families that think they're really tight are slowly drifting apart because they're avo usually avoiding conflict instead of practicing how to get into um, conflict in a healthy way. And usually there's nothing that they're doing in the middle. Um, they're in encouraging interdependence to the point of estrangement. Um, there's a wonderful African proverb on this. If you want to go fast, go alone. And all the entrepreneurs I've ever worked with know what I'm talking about there. But if you want to go far, go together. And that really is what we're primarily encouraging. You're going to do this as a family anyway. What would it look like if we add a little bit of this? So my wife and I created what we call the seven-step process to help a family move from that red dot in the middle down towards the interdependent phase. Now this sounds un-American, I know so far, because come on, it's the declaration of, and everybody says independence, but it really isn't. If you read it, it's really the declaration of interdependence. The most famous line in that document is not, I hold these truths to be self-evident. It's we hold these truths to be self-evident. It's a we document. We are separating ourselves from you guys over there in England because our values are different. And so it was an us, document before it was a separation from from you if you really want to get goosebumps read the last line of the declaration of independence we mutually pledge each other our lives our fortunes and our sacred honor that's kind of what when parents say i die for my children okay great why aren't we then more intentional about building the sense of who we are as a family? Interdependence bring, is being a part of something bigger and it brings resilience, grit and freedom ultimately. Well, the seven-step process that we created, this comes from all the families that we worked with and also the ones we researched and all that. There's been a lot of research down the area. I wish I could say it's just black and white. Do this and you succeed and do this and you fail. It isn't. But there are themes you're seeing in families that tend to be present in most families that are succeeding multi-generationally. What we tried to do is build um, kind of on each other. What do we think are the ones that, they're, that we're most likely seeing and then going up from there and that we think are foundational before you go the next level up. And we start at the bottom. This is a list that starts at the bottom because you got to build a foundation before you go up. So the first thing we do is an assessment of where they are today. I could share information if you'd like, you know, again, I can't teach you uh, enough in this, but I can share with you some concepts if you want call and we can kind of get into more of this um, about what this could look like. But then we think that there's an education process and normally the first part of the education is we share with the family the assessment we did of their family and they find it really eye opening because they, they set themselves, um, they set their own agenda. They tell you what's really important and what they're not doing really well at and um, in, the, in, in the assessment process and that creates the uh, agenda for the education of what do they need to learn. So um, there's more education there. This is another place that I think advisors can really step in. You can help your families with, especially with the literacy around wealth, but there's much more you can get into on the culture around wealth as well, if you add that to your mix. The next level we think up uh, above that is now that the family uh, has an assessment and they kind of, they understand the, the issues and they're now a little bit more motivated, do they know how to talk to each other? Most families actually, um, you know, if I've had a hard time talking the last 10 times I tried, trying an 11th time but speaking louder is typically not a good strategy. <laughs> uh, 
how do I communicate with you differently? And this is where we teach families their communication, their leadership style. And, um, and I'll show you what that looks like if I have a, a minute. Um, we think, so again, now we've learned how to communicate with each other. Then we think we need to teach the family how to practice and manage conflict. My wife was a relationship coach before we, we merged together. And she had built out what we call now empathic communication. But how do we practice and manage conflict? Avoiding it is not healthy. Um, and how do we do it in a safe way where it's actually, you know, you can get into a conversation about things you disagree with um, actually in a safe way. It sounds, un, it sounds like impossible in America now. It's actually quite common and quite possible. We have to be taught that. Um, then from now that they can communicate with each other and express their differences, how do they then start talking about their individual and their shared values? And values to us leads to then what's the purpose of their family, what's the purpose of their family wealth, which leads to then what, what's their vision for the future, what would their mission statement if they want to have one look like then to accomplish all this stuff and all of that work if they shared that with the advisors on this call you could put together a better estate plan if you heard that shared message of what they agree they'd like to accomplish um, but if they don't do it it's much harder for you to create a plan that's going to include all this this we think then leads to the actions they can start taking to get on that journey to where they want to go. And then the final step of the whole process is, okay, how do we take all this work we did with our family legacy advisors coming up with what our purpose is and mesh that into the estate plan um, that we're putting together with our, with our advisors? Carolyn, I see you coming on. Yeah, Tom, you know, as wow, thinking about all these different steps and the family, it it makes me wonder, you know, I bet the family is at different ages. And I wonder if the communication, uh, how do you have that challenge when you, you know, probably have families that have all different age groups trying to work on this together? What have you seen work best? Oh, that's a great question. And thank you for slowing me down on that because that's um, um, a lot of people wonder about that. What we're finding is um, a lot of the content is very similar, but you share it differently. When uh, families have children that are from three years old to 14 years old, roughly those ages, uh, it's not so much that you can engage them in learning this stuff and that they're, you're, they can tell you their values. They're parroting what their parents tell. So, But you can work with their parents of what lifestyle they might be raising these children in, the culture they could raise them in, the vocabulary, the patterns that they can raise these children in, teaching them about when they're, when they're really pliable about philanthropy and engagement, things like that. Um, so you can do a lot of work there, but we're normally working with the parents on what they could be doing with their children. Once the children get to about 15 or 14, they can engage, they can be a part of the family meeting, they can make decisions that have consequence, um, and they can make investment choices and things like that. And they're learning, so ideally it's pretty small, but from there, from 14 or so up to about 25, uh, we're really bringing them into a, what it would look like to work with your siblings together um, and, and learn about how to work together. From about 26 up to about 36, it's where they're bringing spouses into the family and where, how do we bring spouses in? And, uh, and then from 40 or so up, what we're finding is uh, many times parents say, my kids are in their 40s. They're already baked. I'm not going to restart the, the baking process here. And I say, I agree. But if we focus with them on what they could do to raise their children differently, they pretty quickly recognize the best thing they could do to evidence a different pattern for their children is to change the pattern of how they're working with their siblings. And it often brings them back into want to do something with their sibling because that's modeling different behavior to their children. And Tom, you just brought up another point about bringing in the in-laws or however that looks that there's also age and times and just building that into how is our family going to do that? I'm sure too often you've seen it just left to kind of accident, almost how it does or doesn't happen. Oh, it's a re again really good point, and it's one of the first things we address when we talk to the parents or a prospect. They'll often wonder, "Well, wait a minute, we're going to talk about the estate plan, right? Because that's what you guys do." So I'm not bringing my in-laws mm -hmm. in. I mean, I don't want my kids' my spouses there. Um, and I'm saying, "Where do you? Why do you think I'm going to talk about the estate plan?" 
if you looked at the seven step process, we're going to do an assessment of where you think the family is. We're going to talk about, you know, an education of just some of the language that people need to know. We're going to actually learn a communication, how to, we're going to learn about uh, conflict management. We're going to learn about values. We're not talking about the estate plan until way up in the process. And that's not till the second or third meeting. We really encourage, you know, if, if you think that you're going to avoid issues by not inviting the spouses, um, that's not proving to be the case. Pillow talk is, they will hear, but they're going to hear pillow talk. Pillow talk is very different than reality. And so wouldn't you rather hear these things about who these people are that are part of their family in the room? Um, it, you know, as Hamilton, it's who's in the room. And, um, and you can have an executive session where you talk about the money related issues, but ideally that's really short. And, uh, but the family related issues, everyone should be involved in. And many of those cross tie activities I was talking about are opportunities for those spouses to be actively involved in the family in philanthropy or next vacation planning or uh, coming up with the, you know, the family mission statement. They can be actively involved in who they are. And I'm just envisioning seeing all the cousins and second cousins and getting to, to build it. Well, thanks, Tom. Thanks for spending a little more time on that. Yeah, sure. Um, well, the uh, second step in that process is the education. I said earlier, this is where I think a lot of you advisors can, um, and, and again, call if you'd like. I'd love to talk to you about what that could look like if you want to add a little education for the family in your program. Communication, George Bernard Shaw had a great quote where he said, the single biggest problem with communication is the illusion that has taken place because there's so many ways we can mess up communication. There's what I want to say. There's what I actually say. There's what you heard me say, and then there's what you think I meant by it. And then there's my body language. And I think I got my point across. If I think I got my point across, I'm delusional. Um, and so how do we help a family actually get through all this to a place of really communicating effectively? Um, we use a tool that actually helps a family learn where everybody in the family is from a communication standpoint, and then learn how to style shift. I don't have time to show it, unfortunately, today. But um, again, these are great opportunities to give us a call, and we can uh, talk you through some of these. The next step up, those are, I think, an critically important area. How do you practice and manage conflict? And this is what my wife uh, calls empathic communication. But normally, families, um, when it comes to conflict, are over here in the conflict avoidance modality. And, you know, just everything's getting going along fine. Why? Because you're avoiding conflict. When you're avoiding conflict, you are actually slowly drifting apart uh, because you're not getting into uh, learning about the other person, what drives them, what is inside them that motivates and drives them. And so they, uh, they slowly drift apart until they have a fast split. And now they need expensive mediation and or therapy and or they, uh, or they have a very expensive, you see lawsuits all the time, a billion dollar lawsuits going in in my hometown on this very issue over a beer distributorship um, right now because they're having a family explosion. What they bypassed in going from here to here was the whole middle ground of practicing and managing conflict. And families that don't have conflict, this is what my wife calls empathic communication, which I'll, I'll show what it looks like just briefly. But families that don't have conflict are avoiding it. There are three components to empathic communication, though. The first step is getting to understanding. Do I really know what drives this other person? What, mo what you know, what that squirrel on the treadmill in them, do I know what's motivating that? Is it fear? Is it jealousy? Is it anger? Is it, what is it? I mean, and are we getting there? If I don't know where they're coming from, I'm very likely to misunderstand what, they're, what they want to accomplish. If I don't understand what, what their goals are, I'm going to misunderstand why we're not getting there to my goals. The second thing that uh, we think empathic communication is, though, is being able to safely express a frustration. Because I will have frustrations. I will have differences. Uh, that's fine. But how do I safely express it? And it's usually not in the moment. Usually we make an appointment. And then the third phase is, OK, I've now, um, you know, I've, we've. I've got to a place of understanding you. I've expressed where I still find differences and, and difficulty. How do I get to repair with you? And that actually is a governing structure. How do I, with you together, come up with a method that you and I are going to work together? This governance, it's decision-making. Group Governance is group decision-making. How are we going to work together? And what would that look like? One of the Green family members of Hobby Lobby fame uh, had a wonderful quote for this. This was one of the grandchildren's 
husband. And, uh, and he said, this family brings me into the family meetings, and they were doing it even before we got married. <laughs> and um, talk about bringing spouses in, they're bringing in significant others, and they're learning about each other's values and what they care about and engaging in some of those, those railroad tie um, activities and all. And he said, this family recognizes, and it's so powerful, that we need to build the bridge of grace and trust with each other so we can drive the truck of truth over it. There can't be a better, I mean, that's our motto now, um, because the, the fam, what we're helping a family build is build a bridge of grace and trust so they can drive that truck. They have to speak truth if they're going to get to a conflict resolution and deal with family businesses and the estate plan and where we're going to go and what do we do with the family vacation house. They have to speak truth, but how do they build the bridge of grace and trust first? The number one reason that families are falling apart is due to a lack of trust around group decision making, where they're trying to speak truth without the trust. Well, all of this leads up to then the, the seventh step is how do we blend this all together with the estate plan? And I think um, I mentioned David York before. Uh, he has wonderful imagery for this. Uh, and it's really this simple notion that the family purpose the agreed upon shared family purpose. This is not mom and dad's purpose. It's the agreed upon shared family purpose should drive the planning process and the planning process should support the family purpose. Now, the parents don't have to when they have a chance to hear what the, the agreed upon shared family purpose is, the parents don't have to design a plan that does all that. I'm amazed, though, how often the parents, when they hear what the agreed upon shared family purpose is, where the parents say, wow, it's almost identical to what we were hoping for as well. Why wouldn't I design a plan to fund that? But it ends up looking very different than a traditional estate plan. Um, and if you'd build this very simple imagery, then the money in the business is in the middle going along for the ride. It's a wonderful image. I love it. I think David did a great job of, of portraying that. The only problem is I've almost never seen it exist in reality. In reality, what we almost always see is the, is the tax minimization concerns of the parents and the advisors and the control issues of the parents and the trustees drive the planning process. And the planning process supports the tax minimization and the control issues and the family purposes over in left field that uh, nobody ever focused on. Uh, I just... Um, so here it is, <laughs> family purpose over in left field and never got focused on. How do we bring that into the picture? Well, it, the Family Office Exchange does a lot of work with family offices and an ex example of how very wealthy families uh, are now coming to reality around this. This uh, quote, I just really blew me away, the blue part of this, structures. This is family offices recognizing multi-generational families trying to be successful long-term. Structures that are created contain present and future cultural issues. For example, trusts, foundations, business entities, family offices, private family trust companies. Wait a minute, aren't these the exact strategies we would bring as advisors to the table for a wealthy family? What these families are saying, these things tend to either institutionalize the family dysfunction or they're torn apart by the family. Even if the family doesn't tear it apart, trying to tear it apart in court separates the family forever. And so, um, you know, designing plans to just protect the money don't protect the family. Money doesn't make a family, people do. And that's why Marvin Blum, in your own backyard, for most of you out there in, in, uh, in Dallas and in Fort Worth, Marvin, who created the, the Blum Firm, a founding partner of the Blum Firm, um, it's the largest estate planning practice that I know of that's a, just an estate tax planning practice in the country. They've got like 30 attorneys doing nothing but estate tax planning, um, and that's their practice. But um, he and I were talking about this at a Tiger 21 meeting, and he was uh, recognizing, he said, yeah, this is so important to what I want to do for the clients and all, and this is what we do. And, and we, he, he builds teams of, of advisors that in his firm that would work with a client, a client, an older member and a younger member for continuity in the relationship. Most advisors um, lose their client when the parent dies. The Blum firm is intentionally building teams of advisors within the firm that are working with families that have older and younger members, and they meet with the whole family with that very purpose in mind that we want to maintain these relationships. It'll help the family, not just the firm. It'll help the family. Same with all of you other advisors. How do we build you know, this, this 
teams? How do we work with the rest of the team? And how do we meet the next generation so we have continuity? Well, uh, Marvin and I uh, thought, you know, there's a there's a piece missing. Families that are succeeding multi-generationally are doing things differently. And whatever they're doing differently, they're endowing it, either intentionally or accidentally. Could we take a look at what all these different families are doing and create a structure that other families could incorporate into their own plans, which would encourage the meeting process and endow it. And as we built it out, we called it a FAST, which stood for Family Advancement Sustainability Trust. Um, so it's a mouthful, but it's a FAST, that's simpler. And we wrote an article in Trust in the States magazine a few years ago on this, and we can get a copy of it too if you'd like, but it provides funds for the family I mean, most trusts that the family puts together are designed to distribute money to beneficiaries. This trust is not designed to do that. This trust is designed to invest money in the beneficiaries. Because Marvin put it this way, he said, the big problem that he sees is that G1 buys into family meetings and legacy planning and will pay for it. But G2, this generation two, typically drops the ball. The second generation over the years doesn't want to doesn't want to plan for it, you know, and they often don't want to pay for it. And so, or they're just busy. They're like, and so the idea kind of goes into atrophy. And if, if it delay, delay, delay until it's dead. However, if it's endowed, it is highly likely to keep going. And he finds that usually one of the most practical solutions is to fund a FAST, a trust, with insurance. It's a lower expense to get the endowment down the road to really kick in. The analogy he often uses, the simple analogy of a football game, and he says, you know, that the generation one, they're like the quarterback, and they can throw the perfect pass. And with their advisors, boy, can we tax minimize and set up the right structures, and we got a slat, and it's funded, and oh my goodness, it's incredible. Um, but the receiver, G2 and G3, often doesn't know how to catch the ball. And remember, preparing yourself for wealth you earned over your lifetime is different than preparing a receiver who's going to maybe receives it in a moment. And they're often, they don't know how to receive it. They don't have the vocabulary, the lessons, the teaching, the advisory team, and they don't have a team within the family to do it with. So the FAST provides funds for running the family meeting, paying for the advisors to help, uh, encouraging family philanthropy and gratitude. Um, it, it's designed to endow a family meeting process. You don't walk away with things in your hands from this meeting. You walk away with things in your head, knowledge of who the family are and, uh, and who the family members are. The FAST between mom and dad would be another trust structure that would it be uh, along with all the generation skipping and charitable vehicles the family puts together. We often find that the FAST, which is the yellow one on this picture here, um, does creates the education of the family of how they can use a family bank, which is often a separate structure, but it's better that the FAST educate the family on how to use the family bank, bank and encourage entrepreneurship and also the family foundation. The family, the FAST shouldn't give money to charity, but it can ed it's not as tax efficient, the foundation should, but it can educate the family members on how and why to work together to be able to use the foundation more effectively. Todd, wow. you... Yeah, excuse me. We, we've got about eight minutes. So I just want to give you a heads up on the time. Great. Um, I'm going to jump to then uh, just just showing you that one of the things we often say to parents is the parents that we work with are um, they're more likely to endow a chair at a university to help educate strangers than to endow a chair at their family table to, table to help educate the family. And, you know, so many families I've worked with said, yeah, I endow a chair at Harvard or whatever, but I also, I've got a 529 plan. I'm paying for my kid's education. That's proving my point. They're paying for their children to get educated somewhere else, not within the family. We often use a family diagram to indicate what this can look like. Um, I created this back when I was at Cooper's and Library, and, you know, many, many years ago. It might look convoluted. I, you wouldn't believe how many times clients, so when we can put down their family, they can see themselves in it. And when we put their assets into this, we can put a very complex, we, two weeks ago, we put a billion dollar family's net worth into one of these simple diagrams. And the family, the parents said, this is the first time I've seen our, our whole situation in one picture. Um, but the benefit of this is in the KYC, know your client process that you're all involved in, and that the SEC is talking about getting more involved in. This allows the client to participate because they can see themselves in this fact-finding form. 
they can't see themselves in a form that you might have for fact finding. Uh, one of the pieces of this puzzle is the whole notion of uh, also reviewing the insurance um, work that they're doing. This is a really important area now that because life expectancies have changed quite dramatically during COVID and interest rates are changing quite dramatically. That's affecting a lot of insurance policies are out there. If you haven't had an insurance review done, I know this is something that's near and dear to Todd's heart because he does an insurance review process um, all the time with clients. But if you don't have a process of doing that, highly recommend it um, because this is a good time to do it. But this diagram is a wonderful diagram to use where a family can see themselves in it. Here's an example of one of the, one of the top estate planning attorneys in the country, what he put together for a family to show them their estate plan. I can't see my, I can't, I, I'm an estate planner by background. I can't figure this chart out. And so I just really encourage you use simple imagery and people can get involved in it. Advisors typically build a shield around the client this was an older study looking at who are the main advisors the client described. And they said, my attorney, my accountant, and my investment advisor. But the communication was from the client to the attorney when I need him or her. Um, with the accountant, it was more give and take because we're going to have you know, quarterly meetings. With the investment people, it depended on who they were. If they're Wall Street, they're going to call me with a product or an idea. If they're an, uh, a fiduciary or a registered investment advisor. My point's not the communication between the advisor and the client. It's between the advisors. There's you usually very little. And to make it worse, most of these advisors would often protect their clients from getting ideas from other advisors because they felt threatened many times. When I was at Cooperson Library, if a client came in and said they were thinking of working with Arthur Anderson or they heard a great idea from Arthur Anderson, I got threatened by that. And, and that's normal. I think a new look at advisory teams should include a family legacy advisor. And it could be, it doesn't have to be Gen Leg, it could be other firms, but this is a role we often play. Um, working with the other advisors and the advisors need to be able to work together with the family. It's less expensive for the client and it's better for the result and it's better for the advisors. And in the process, you usually meet the family members, which means you have continuity from one generation to the next. Um, last thing I'll say, and then I'll open it for Q&A, is how much does all this cost? Just take an example of if you had a client with $20 million investments uh, worth of investments over a 10-year period of time, what are they paying for their investments, their planning, and their family legacy work? And they usually keep those things separate, by the way, with mental barriers. Well, in the investments, they'd be lucky if they're paying 25 to 50 basis points. So over 10 years, they're paying between $500,000 and $1 million dollars. In the estate planning and financial planning and investment management work every year, you know, add that up for 10 years, they're probably paying $200,000 or $400,000. What are they usually paying on family governance? Zero. Usually nothing because they just assume family just means this. We all get along. Thanksgiving. Um, and, but what we're finding is if something, a presenting problem comes, they'll spend almost anything on this. Well, that's a lot to um, cover. Um, I, and I, I just want to cover this one last thing, which is we think it's this way, that there's the family and there's, there's family and legacy. There needs to be a legacy lifestyle education. What is a legacy lifestyle? And that is bigger and broader than we have time to get into. But um, Jay Hughes referred to it as there are inheritors and there are stewards. And how do we help educate families on being stewards? There are legacy assets. Usually, the lake house is not a legacy asset. Um, foundations are often not a legacy asset. They can be, but it's how we introduce them and structure them and the governance of them that makes them a legacy asset. And then that leads to legacy structures themselves. Could a fast, a trust, like we were describing before that Marvin and I um, had, had put that idea together, but could we have a legacy structure to hold all this? And that's really what we're doing within families and what we think legacy advisory is all about. So Todd, I went over, I apologize, but I hope, <laughs> I yeah. hope that was well, helpful. That's, that's been good, good stuff, Tom. I, I do want to highlight a couple things. First of all, I want to thank you very much for the challenges you placed before us. And more importantly, for the tools you've given us. Oftentimes we hear these challenges without tools and you've given some very, very specific tools. I want to thank those who are attending. And if you have additional questions, please reach out to us or to Tom. There are additional resources we will send to you. 
but the main ones I think are on the screen there with Tom and his wife, the contact information. I want to highlight a couple of things. Tom will be back in Dallas on May 5th at noon, speaking to the Dallas Estate Planning Council. On the afternoon of May 5th, he'll be speaking to the donors of the Dallas Foundation. And that is specifically for donors. If donors want to invite their advisors, they're certainly welcome to do so. But in general, the, the advisors are not being set a separate, separate invitation. He'll also be back on June 23rd for another session with the Legacy Partners Group, uh, which is something, again, we've got to tell you, give you additional information on if, if you have questions about that. In the information we'll send you, there'll be a book list from Tom, a short list, and then a more detailed list broken down by topic, if you'll find that of interest. And then finally, I want to uh, say that our next meeting will be May 18th at noon, our CNC, Mindy Jones with Pixis will be speaking. And one of the things that we've learned as we all get older is nobody teaches us how to deal with our elderly parents and in-laws. So one of the things Mindy and her team have done is a great job of helping families work through that process so there aren't any surprises. So with that, we'll say thanks for attending. Uh, we really appreciate the attendance and uh, please feel free to reach back out if you have additional questions, we can help provide additional clarity and confidence and coordination with your planning. Thanks again. Have a great afternoon.